So if I fall asleep during my message, I've got an excuse. What about you guys? <laughs> Jonah chapter 2. From inside the fish. Boy, old Jonah, we've left him out there in the water for a long time. A couple weeks now. Um, poor guy. Here he is. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, In my distress I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the current swirled around me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. And I said, I have been banished from your sight. Yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. I love that one. <laughs> to the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord. And my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. <laughs> Don't you love it? Jonah finds himself in a tight, uncomfortable space. Ever been there? <laughs> Ever found in your life a time where you you were lodged in some place and you felt like you were lodged in and it was a little bit too tight and you didn't know how you were going to get out of it again? You ever found yourself in a hopeless place, a place where you didn't know how you were ever going to be saved or delivered from your situation? Well, that's where Jonah finds himself, stuck in the belly of a great big fish. There's something about tight, uncomfortable spaces that we don't like, but yet they're good for us. At least most of them are. Well, there's so many things I'd love to tell you about Kenya, but they're going to wait. Um, hopefully this week, Malou and I can get together our pictures and make a little presentation for you so we can share with you a little bit about what we experienced while we were in Kenya. But we just haven't had time to do that yet. We've got thousands of pictures, I'm sure. And um, we can't show them all to you. You'd be here until 5 o'clock tonight at least. But in any case, there's one picture I did want to show you. Because I saw something while I was walking in the dump. Uh, Yoto in the Hilton area. Which is where the place we were ministering to where the school is. And we were delivering supplies to families of some of the kids that go to the school. And along the way, I found Nineveh. I was so excited about this. Mm -hmm. Did you know there's a Nineveh Church of Christ up, up in the mountain there in Gyoto, just next to the garbage dump? And I'm thinking, now I know why he didn't want to go to Nineveh. <laughs> so there you go. Um, I had to show you that picture, please. Yeah, exactly. It, it needs a little bit more. We think we have a long name to the church, but listen to this one. Nineveh Church of Christ under Lord Jesus Redeeming Grace Church. Now there you go. I like to buy a ball. No. So there we go. But we all find ourselves from time to time in uncomfortable spaces. Hemmed in. In a tight, narrow space. And as I was thinking about that this week, as I was between Amsterdam and San Francisco, sitting in the middle seat between other people... We all find ourselves in those tight spaces of life. Now, I have to admit that being in a big airplane flying from Amsterdam to San Francisco, I probably had it a lot nicer than Jonah did inside of a slimy big fish. But nonetheless, I could relate a little bit to what he was going through there, feeling a little hemmed in. But I think about, about it, how so many of us experience these things. We all find ourselves in tight spaces. Je Jesus told us, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. But in this world, you're going to have trouble. They're going to have troubles. 
But take heart, he says. I have overcome the world. We're all going to find ourselves in tight spaces. And if you're not in one right now, then you're going to find someday that you're in a tight space. That's why James tells us whenever, he says, consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds. Whenever. It's inevitable. We're all going to find a tight space somewhere along the line. There's going to be a time where your faith is being tested. There's going to be a time when the circumstances of life are not what you want to experience. Where you're going to feel like, am I ever going to get out of this alive? Is God ever going to listen to my prayer? Am I going to make it through this tight space? That I'm in right now. But we recognize, as James did, that, G that God is using these things in our life to help us to grow and mature in our faith and to grow in His grace so that we can become perfect and mature in Him. Tight and comfortable spaces. We don't like them very much, but there's one thing that they tend to do to us. They make us pray. And that's exactly what happened with Jonah. Jonah, that rebellious prophet, that stubborn, hard-headed prophet, and I'm not exaggerating because he was every bit of that, who ran the other direction when God called him to Nineveh. He ran toward Tarshish, the complete other direction. <laughs> and he, wherever he would go, it seems like he's always making mistakes. He's always running the other direction. He's running from the presence of the Lord. But even old hard-headed, rebellious Jonah comes to his knees when he finds himself in the belly of a big fish, a tight, uncomfortable place. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the belly of the fish. You see, sometimes it takes a tight space, a difficult situation, to get us to our knees. And now, it ought not to be that way, but it is often that way in our lives. Um, many people just pray when they get in a tough spot. And Jonah seemed reluctant to pray at first. Remember when he was on the boat and he was, on, he was down sleeping and everybody else was praying to their God and the captain has to come wake him up and tell him, you need to start praying to your God because maybe he'll listen and the storm will be over. Well, there's no indication in the text that Jonah actually ever prayed in that. I mean, he, everybody else is praying and God ultimately does deliver them from it all. But there's no indication that his first reaction is, oh yeah. Let me get on my knees and start praying. But yet, drowning in the sea and then finding himself in the belly of this big fish were two incidents that seemed to push him to his knees. He says in verse 7, When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Now what he's talking about there is when he was in the water. So what it tells us in the first verse here is he was praying when he was in the fish. But that wasn't where it started. It was when he was drowning. It's when he was thrown over into the water, and he was going under, and he had seaweed around his neck, around his head, and he was, felt like he was going under for the last time. That's when he started praying. <laughs> and wouldn't you? <laughs> I think we all would. Um, but we see in Jonah somebody who at least has some evidence that he knows something about prayer, and has in the past at least been someone who had prayed. And I'm going to show you that in a minute. Although he's kind of gotten out of the practice when he was trying to run away from God. Many of us have prodigal experiences in life. We were walking with the Lord, we were doing well, we got started right, and then we kind of took a little detour in the other direction. We tried to run away from God. We thought, well, I'll do it my own way. I know better. You know, God, I know you want me to do this, but I'm going to do this instead. And Jonah's going through one of those times in his life. And when we're going in those opposite directions from where the Lord wants us to go, we're often reluctant to pray. We're afraid of what God might say. <laughs> we're afraid of what God might do. We ought to be afraid of what God might do, but not because of our praying, of course, as we learn in this story. Of Jonah. So I want to make a few observations about Jonah's prayer here, which is the essence of what chapter 2 is. It's a prayer. It's a psalm, really. Um, a thanksgiving psalm, interestingly. So Jonah prays to the Lord from the belly of the fish. And what did he have to say? What can we learn from his prayer? First thing I notice about Jonah's prayer is that it's rooted in a life of praying the psalms. 
It's rooted in a life of praying the Psalms. Now, I, you may not realize this, but in Judaism, among Jews, the Psalms were the prayer book. That's where they learned how to pray. That collection of 150 or so Psalms that uh, go way back to David and Asaph and other people who wrote these beautiful songs and prayers to God. These became the very means by which people learned how to pray. And often what happens, you find in seasoned prayer worries, is that Scripture starts to seep into their prayers. Uh, I often tell our Wednesday night group when we're praying to be bold, to be brief, to be biblical is one of the things I always tell them. I have the bees of praying. And I always encourage us to pray Scripture as much as we possibly can. Remember the promises of Scripture. Pray Scripture into being, because it's powerful to our praying. And so, this is where the Jewish people learn how to pray. They learn from the Psalms. And I'm going to show you how he does that in just a minute. But you know what? It wasn't just the Jewish people. In the early church, they used the Psalms as a prayer book, too. And you find it in the East, and you find it in the Western traditions, all the way from the first century on up. At the heart of prayer was praying Psalms. And it's still true for many of us today. I don't. Some of us have kind of gotten away from praying psalms, but I always encourage people, as you begin your prayer time, focus in on, on psalm and let that kind of prime the pump of your praying. It really does help us focus on God. And there's there's a there's a psalm for just about everything that you're going through. There's times that you need to lament to God and just tell Him what you feel in life. And life isn't feeling so good right now. And there's times we need that. And there's other ones that are thanksgiving psalms, and there's praise psalms, and there's wisdom psalms, and, and there's some that point forward to Christ, and mess messianic psalms. There's all different kinds of psalms. But for every conceivable situation or every conceivable mood we find ourselves in, there's a psalm for it. You just need to pray them. And pray them enough so that you know them well. Eugene Peterson has a little book he wrote about pastoral life that's taken from the book of Jonah. And in it, he, he talks about this little section. He says, Jonah has been to school to learn to pray. And he prayed as he had been taught. His school was the Psalms. Line by line, Jonah's prayer is furnished with vocabulary from the Psalms. And he gives some examples. He says, the, these, these phrases are taken directly from Psalms. Uh, from Psalm 18.6 and 120, verse 1, he talks about my distress. He talks about Sheol. And this is a concept that's found often in Psalms, like Psalm 18, 4 through 5. Or it says, all the waves and billows passed over me, like it says in Psalm 42.7. From thy presence is a common phrase in the Psalms. Psalm 139.7, for example. Upon thy holy temple... We find in Psalm 5, 7. The water closed in over me, Psalm 69, 2. My life was redeemed from the pit, Psalm 30, verse 3. My soul fainted within me, Psalm 142, verse 3. Into thy holy temple, from Psalm 18, verse 6. Salvation belongs to the Lord, from Psalm 3, verse 8. Now, there's, do you get it? He's... He's bringing all these phrases and these images from the Psalms. He evidently has prayed them enough that he knows these Psalms, and they become a part of his prayer language. It's not like he's just praying spontaneous prayers, whatever he's thinking. He's praying Scripture, and he's making these allusions to all these other Psalms that talk about people in times of distress who feel like the they're in tight spaces and they're never going to get out and they need the deliverance and salvation of God, he takes those kind of psalms and he applies them to his situation. Boy, that's a beautiful way to pray. Take the promises of Scripture. Take the psalms in particular and find the ones that meet your need, that, that relate to where you're at, and then personalize them to your own situation. Well, to, I kind of added to Eugene Peterson's words, because um, here's the rest of the quote. And there's other ones, and more. Not a word in the prayer is original. Jonah got every word, lock, stock, and barrel out of his Psalms book. Isn't that interesting? You see, the phrases that he uses here, and the images that he uses here, 
are the kind of images you find all the way through the Psalms. So while he's falling down into the water, he's going down deeper and deeper, he's reflecting on the scriptures he knows. And he begins to pray them. And he begins to relate to them in a way he probably never has before. He's that all the waves and breakers coming over me, you know, all these kind of ideas that we find in the Psalms that were metaphors for people that were going through difficult times. He knew what it was literally to have that happen in his life. And so he's praying from that scripture as he, as he pours out his heart to God. Um, there's so many things I could say here, but I'm just going to, uh, let me just keep moving here. So, the essence of what I wanted to say about the Psalms is this. The words and the metaphors that he's, like drowning becomes this metaphor for, you know, when you just feel overwhelmed by life. And aren't we all there at times? Sure we are. We all find ourselves in tight spaces. So what do you do? Run to the scripture you know. Run to the promises of God. Run to the psalms that describe your situation and pray them to God. They're powerful. They're a powerful school of prayer. Second thing I notice about Jonah's prayer, it's honest, it's real, there's no pretending, there's no games. Some of us, when we pray, think, oh, I have to figure out, I have to check my motives, make sure I'm praying it right, and, there's some people play games when they pray. Oh, I have to use flowery language or else God won't listen to me. I have to use these and those and, and you know, big words that nobody understands or else God won't understand. There's none of that in Jonah's prayer. It's just honest, open, here's where I'm at, this is my situation, and God, I need your salvation, I need your deliverance. And that's good praying. Good praying is just open, honest, pour out your heart to God. Tell Him where you're at. Just pour it all out to Him. You don't have to you know, say, oh Lord, I'm, you know, we play so many games when we pray. No need to play games. Listen to Him a little bit. In my distress, I called to the Lord. He answered me. From the deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help. And you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths. And in the very heart of the sea, and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers, they swept over me. I said, I've been banished from your sight. Yet I will look again toward your holy temple. That's really where he was. He was in the sea, and he was going down. He thought he was going to drown. And then God delivered him. In a most unusual way, but he delivered him. As a great big fish came and swallowed him whole. Is that a reason to have a little thanksgiving to the Lord? Now, you might be still a little bit concerned about still being inside the great big fish, but at least God got you out of the water, which is a good first step, right? And that's kind of where he finds himself. Real prayer is just open and honest, and it's vulnerable, and, and we just tell God where we're at. There's no reason to try to play games with him. We just tell him what's on our heart. So, right. Um, Jonah's prayer, another thing I like about it is that it's a thanksgiving prayer. <clears throat> you know, when I first looked at this, I was thinking that this was more of a lament. But as I got looking at it more carefully, it's not, it's not really a lament. There's elements of lament. But it's primarily a thanksgiving psalm. And you think, why is he thanking God while well, he's still inside the belly of the big fish? But that's exactly what he's doing here. <coughs> Um, a prayer of thanksgiving. Leslie Allen says, seeing himself to be safe in his odd conveyance. In other words, the big fish. Jonah prays. It's a prayer of thanksgiving for deliverance from a watery grave. Um, there are different kinds of psalms, as I mentioned it. Uh, the, the greatest number of psalms are lament psalms. They're the ones where we pour out our heart to God and open and honest and just you know, tell God where we're at. We feel far and distant. We wonder if he's going to answer our prayers. Most of the psalms, actually the biggest percentage are like that. But there are praise and there are thanksgiving psalms and other kinds. And one of the kinds of psalms is called a thanksgiving psalm. Examples would be Psalm 18, Psalm 30, 34, 40, 66, 116, 118, 138. These are all clearly thanksgiving psalms. And interestingly... Um, 
they have a pattern that follows. Um, there was a scholar who did a lot of study on identifying the different kinds of psalms, and he said, there's a pattern in Thanksgiving psalms, and here's what it is. First of all, I have an introduction. And here we have an introduction in verse 2. He talks about how the Lord heard him and answered his prayer. That's his introduction. And then he describes the distress or the trouble that the person is in. And we see that exactly. And here he's going under the water. All the breakers are over me. I feel like I've got seaweed around my neck. I'm about ready to go under. And then in verse 6, we find the third element the report of God's deliverance. Not only has God um, heard his prayer, but here he delivers him from his distress. And then they always end with a conclusion. And often within the conclusion, there is a vow that is made in a thanksgiving song. God, I want to renew my vow to serve you. You've been good to me. And I'm thankful for how you have rescued me from my distress. And now I want to live for you. I vow myself, and in a special and a new way, I now make a vow to you, to serve you. And we see that exact pattern in what Jonah is praying. It's a thanksgiving psalm that is drawn from the language of the psalms. So Jonah apparently is more of a theologian than we realize. And he seems to know the scripture a lot more than what we would normally think. Because the only thing we know about him about is, is his rebellion, right? But apparently this man has had a life of prayer. And he has had a life of studying and living out scripture. But for whatever reason, he's taken a little prodigal turn. But we still see the foundations of a life of prayer in him. So why is he thankful? Well, mostly, probably because he didn't drown. <laughs> Which was a pretty good thing. You've been thrown overboard, and you're fall and you don't swim very well, and you're you're going under, and you got seaweed around your neck, and you're about ready to die. And you'd be pretty thankful too if somebody came and rescued you from the deep. And indeed, that's what it says. A straightforward reading of chapter two indicates that the psalm was meant as a praise for deliverance, not so much from the fish, but from drowning. But there's an, there could be more to it. Um, Charles Feinberg makes the point that in spite of the fact he tried to flee from the Lord, he knew positively that God had not abandoned him and re had remained now as formerly his trustworthy God. By faith, Jonah saw, sees his deliverance and thanks God for it before it actually is accomplished. So there may be two aspects to his thanksgiving in the psalm. On the one hand, he's thankful for the way God has delivered him from the sea from drowning. And that he can look back on and already see the hand of God. He can see how God's been in his, working in his life, bringing salvation and deliverance. But he's got one more obstacle to go. He's still got to get to the shore somehow. And right now he's tight in the belly of the great fish. But thanksgiving is often a helpful tool when we find ourselves in a tight place. Remembering what God has done in the past helps us to face the trials of the present and of the future. There's something very powerful about beginning to recount what God has already done that gives us hope. It keeps us moving. It keeps us moving in the right direction. And we refuse to give up. If God has saved me from the water, well, maybe he's going to do something about this big fish, too. So his thanksgiving, by faith, was that God would finish the work he started. He started by getting him out of the deep, but now he's got to get him out of that fish somehow. So verse 9 is an indication that Jonah is certain that he's going to be delivered from this fish's belly. Um, so why is he thankful? Because he's looking back to God's deliverance, and he's looking ahead to God's ongoing deliverance by faith. So it's a song of thanksgiving. Jonah's prayer is a means of grace for Jonah. It's a way in which he allows God to begin to change his heart. Um, one of the things I know about prayer is that when we pray, God changes us. Now, that's not all God does. God changes things, too. You know, things happen when we pray. God does hear and answer prayer. And we don't want to give up on that. But one of the things that's most important about prayer 
is as we spend time pouring out our hearts to God, He changes our hearts. He changes us. And we begin to see the first evidence of some change in Jonah when he begins to pray in the belly of the fish. So it becomes that means of God's grace entering his life and him actually turning his heart toward God again, repenting, beginning at least to repent and turn toward God. Now we're going to find out that he only goes so far, but at least we see some change in the right direction in Jonah's life. So for example, in verse 9 he says, But I with shouts of grateful praise will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. Now that's there's a big change in his heart to make that statement from where he had been. Where he was running completely in the opposite direction. Refusing the call of God upon his life. To preach to Nineveh. Here he's, oh, God, I, 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 I return to my vows to you. I want to serve you. And salvation belongs to the Lord. Deliverance belongs to the Lord. What I vow, I'm going to make good. I'm going to follow through now. At least this is his heart. Uh, as one writer says, Jonah resists God for a long time, but once he's in the belly of the fish, he can do nothing else but pray. And once he starts to turn to God, he begins, albeit slowly, to change. And how true it is. As we take these things to the Lord, when we find ourselves in tight places, we pray and we change. Jonah's prayer Another thing I like about it is that he finds hope in the hesed, the loving kindness of God. I love the Hebrew word hesed, one of my favorite Hebrew words, um, and it's translated love in the NIV in this text, but sometimes mercy, sometimes loving kindness, sometimes faithfulness, and there are a number of other ways it can be translated, but it's all of that and more. The hesed of God is one of, the, it's one of the phrases that we see over and over in the Psalms and throughout the, the Old Testament. It's a description of God's love for his covenant people, Israel. And it, it's his stubborn love that refuses to give up on his people. That's what hesed really is. God remains faithful and committed in love to his people even when they run the other direction. Even when they are idolatrous and unfaithful, he remains faithful to his covenant. He remains faithful to the commitments that he's made to his people. And even when they are so unfaithful, and when they're Jonah-like, he still loves them. That's Hassan. His faithful love, his kindness, his mercy, expressed to those that he's entered into a covenant with. And I guarantee you, it's just as true for us today who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, he has that same kind of love for us. That stubborn love that refuses to give up on us, no matter how Jonah-like and hard-headed we can sometimes be. And it's that that Jonah appeals to in his prayer. And there's a certain irony in the way he says it in verse 8. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's hesed, from God's love. For them. Um, I like what Elizabeth Actemeyer said. She said that Jonah criticizes those who rely on worthless idols is an ironic note. Until at this time of prayer, Jonah has not relied on Yahweh at all. But now, seemingly, he's realized his dependence on God for his life. And the verse accords with the rest of the Thanksgiving song. Um, he's He's saying that those who cling to worthless idols. And who has that been in the story? The sailors, right? But the sailors were more faithful, and they turned to God already, right? There was a little revival that took place on the boat because these pagan sailors who worshipped all these other gods turned toward the loving kindness of God. And Jonah was missing out on it. So there's a great irony in what he's saying here. Because he's the one who wasn't listening to God. And now, finally, he's relenting. He's saying, oh God, you have been so faithful to me. I know about your loving kindness. I know about that stubborn love that you have for your people. And I have been rebellious. I, I mean, I'm putting some words in his mouth here, but that's kind of the essence of what he's saying here. He appeals to the essence of God. 
Um, the second line of verse 8 reads in the Hebrew, they forsake their hesed. They deprive themselves of the steadfast love of God, which manifests itself in God's gracious acts. Um, there's something powerful when we remember who our God is when we come in prayer. That He's gracious and merciful, and He's all powerful. In fact, I always love to start praying by just remembering who God is mm -hmm. and enumerating his attributes, his characteristics, and remembering his promises because then I'm ready to pray with faith. I first of all need to recognize who he really is mm -hmm. and how he acts toward us. And that's what Jonah is doing here. He's remembering the loving kindness, the faithfulness, mercy of God toward his people. And he said, that's the basis upon which I can appeal my prayer. And so it is. The more we know who God is, the more we study His scriptures and know His promises, the more boldly we can come to Him with our prayers. And so Jonah here, once again, gives us a great example in our praying. One other observation from the text, and that's this. When you're in tight spaces, whether it's in the belly of a great fish, or you're stuck between two people in an airplane seat, or it's a trial of life, whatever it might be, God is with you. All the way through this book, we see the providential hand of God. It's God who speaks to Jonah. It's God who raises up a big storm, a great storm. It's God who stills the storm once Jonah is thrown into the deep. It's God who rescues Jonah through a great big fish. It's God who keeps Jonah safe for three days and three nights inside the belly of this big slimy fish. And we don't know all the details of it, but we know that God kept him safe and protected him through that whole thing. And God then motivated the fish, my favorite part, to vomit. <laughs> it's very rare when you get to say that in preaching. But here it is. He caused the fish to throw up onto the land, and so from the boat to the belly, from the burp to the beach. There I got it. I can see it. There it is. I had played you that song a couple weeks ago. Um, there it is. And in all of it, God was at work. Jonah's running the other direction, but God in his steadfast love refuses to give him up, and he follows him, and he cuts him off at every turn. And you could be thankful that you serve that kind of a God. God is with you wherever your tight spaces, wherever you feel hopeless, wherever it is that you think, oh, I don't know if I'm ever going to get through this. I feel like I'm going under, Lord. I got seaweed around my neck. I'm about ready to go under for the last time. No, he's with you. He's with you. Whatever the trial of life that you might be going through, God is with you. All his ways are loving and faithful, as the psalmist says. And from first to last, God has been with Jonah, pursuing with stubborn love. And guess what? He's doing the same with you and with me. The sea is the enemy, the bearer of death. The fish, well, that's Jonah's ally by divine provision. And this fish stands for divine grace. The end of the psalm, salvation belongs to the Lord, is an apt commentary on the significance of the adjacent narrative. This commentary, which the whole psalm eloquently amplifies, is basic to the meaning of the book. This is, a, this is what this book is all about. Salvation belongs to the Lord. God, over and over, in response to repentance and faith, brings salvation and deliverance to the most unlikely people. Pagan sailors, a prodigal prophet, and the city of Nineveh evil, wicked city that will one day come and take into captivity, will utterly destroy the northern kingdom. But there's a time where they repent and they turn toward God and salvation belongs to the Lord. You can't count anybody out. If God can work in those cases, he can work in the toughest one you know. Who do you know, who do you think, is beyond the reach of the Lord? You don't know anybody. <laughs> you don't know a person. <sighs> well, 
It's probably... One last quote. Jonah's prayer closes with the assurance that God is heard. His ear is ever open to the cry of the righteous. There's the hope, people. God is with you. And you might be feeling like you're in a tight space and you wonder where the hope is. But he does hear. And he will act at the right time in his own way. Salvation and deliverance belongs So, Lord, um, help us. Uh, Lord, this is one time where we get to follow the example of Jonah. <laughs> Most of the time we should resist his example and go the other way. But here he does the right thing. He prays, utilizing the text of Scripture in the Psalms. And he prays honestly and truthfully. And he pours out his heart to you. And there's a repentance that takes place, a change that begins to take place in him. And there's a renewed vow to, to declare the salvation of God, the very thing he's been running from doing. And little bit by little bit, we change as we spend time with you. Thank you, God, for reminding us that you're with us. Whatever we're going through today, remind us that you're with us. And in your steadfast love, your stubborn, faithful love, you're there. So continue to work in our lives, demonstrating your faithfulness, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, how about we sing a song and we're going to go to the communion table. But there's a little song I was thinking about. God will make a way. Now, Jonah's situation is kind of a strange way, but um, God has is an endlessly creative in ways of bringing deliverance and help to us. So let's sing it together. Mm -hmm.